All right, we'll wrap up this lecture. It's a little bit long because I had three short stories and some other material to cover. We'll wrap up this uh, third part of uh, the video series uh, with Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper. And she also, hey, it's a very nice thing that an author tells you why they wrote something. Uh, so hopefully you had a chance to read through that as well. Uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, she another woman who was not in a happy marriage, I'm afraid. Um, that's the way it turned out to be for her. And um, uh, she was... Um, uh, a, a very successful writer early on. This particular piece was championed by some of the leading literary figures of the late 19th, early 20th century, but it didn't do too, too well because the topic of mental instability or mental health was one that was a rather taboo topic. Um, it was, uh, there's an old joke. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the joke. Um, you know, in uh, up north, uh, they take their crazy relatives and they stick them in the attic. Uh, down south, we bring them out on the front porch to wave at everybody going by. Uh, so um, it's, it probably says more about the, the the south than it does the north. But it, mental illness as a as a, um, as a topic has been one that's really been taboo. It still is kind of taboo even today, despite the fact that people are willing to talk about it a lot more than they were a hundred years ago. Um, here we have a story that I think is really important to take note of with respect to its narrative perspective. How long did it take you to discover what was going on? If you don't realize that the narrator's not got a full grip on reality early on, certainly by the end, hopefully you picked that up. Um, it kind of sneaks up on you. So you have a an unreliable narrator in many regards, a narrator who really doesn't know what's going on. And we don't either at first. I mean, I don't blame you. When you when she gives you the description of the room and everything that she stays in, you're thinking, well, maybe that's plausible. I guess so. Yeah, maybe. What you realize, though, as the story unfolds is that they've decided to take time away from their regular home in the city to spend time at this different place and this different place is outfitted quite unusually. Um, it's not the kind of place a husband and wife would go and stay for vacation. And even so, if they did, you wouldn't have the wife live in this upper room, which is very unusual. She attributes certain things to the to the idea that maybe this place was a nursery or a, a playroom for kids who were just kind of rowdy and rambunctious. You know, there's a bed, but it's nailed to the floor. You know, these kids, they move the beds around. There's a lot of scratches all over the place. There's even rings, metal rings in the wall, uh, bars on the window. You know, you can't be too careful. Kids jump out of the window. Kids like to do gymnastics. They get a little rowdy and stuff. What you realize real quickly, though, if you're a perceptive reader, is... Mm hmm. They've rented this house for a specific purpose, and the purpose is because her entire family, but in particular, in particular, her physician husband believes that she's becoming mentally unstable, and they're locking her up in the crazy room, which is at the top of the of the stairs. Um, and the house has been used for that in the past. Somebody has kept crazy people in that room before. Why is the bed nailed down so that you can't go anywhere with it and you can't turn it over on yourself? Why are there rings in the wall to tie people up with? Why are there scratches everywhere? Well, kind of crap. Bars in the window. I mean, all these now have some sense of, you know, once you realize what's going on. So the story is really kind of a descent into madness. And the, uh, the wallpaper becomes this metaphor for her trying to seek meaning in life trying to find meaning in a pattern that seems meaningless. Her life is a pattern that's meaningless. I mean, you can really go deep, pretty, pretty deep with this. Um, it, is an, it is a remarkable story because, one, it does have some bearing on Gilman's view of marriage. Um, poor Gilman um, uh, developed breast cancer uh, and committed suicide because she did not want to go through the pain and suffering. So medical-related things were very, very significant to her because she experienced a lot of things. This is based on a on her own life. Uh, guess what we recognize this illness as now? Postpartum depression, right? Um, in the Victorian era, the greatest and highest thing that a woman could experience is motherhood. And when you are experiencing depression and other problems, you begin to compound that difficulty with the idea that 
You know, I'm supposed to be happy and I'm not. What kind of a horrible person am I that I'm not happy? I mean, they've told me all my life that the happiest thing that could happen to me is to become a mom. And here I am sad and depressed and lonely and 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 really and and it feeds on itself because of that people just didn't understand they just did not understand today i think they don't understand we still hear cases of women who are suffering from postpartum depression they do things that they would not normally do um and uh people still find great fault with them and that's a very unfortunate thing but what you have in this story is this woman's descent into madness because it is not merely the postpartum depression that is compounding things. Her husband, John, is a physician. If you notice their dialogue, he really treats her like a child. You know, she will be as sick, bless her little heart, she'll be as sick as she wants to be. Um, he treats her as a patient, but also as a wife. He treats her as a child, but also as a lover, which is kind of weird. Um, you know, in the daytime, he locks her up and tells her what to do and what not to do like a child. At night, he comes and sleeps with her. So he clearly sees her as, a, you know, a, a lover. Um, it's a really, really weird kind of thing. And he even has his sister come in uh, along with a, a, a caretaker, a servant named Jenny. And these two women, between the two of them, take over all of what would normally be considered her, her proper duties as the woman of the house. Remember we talked about, with um, particularly Anne Bradstreet, um, a woman having a domestic sphere. It wasn't just these were your jobs and your duties. This was your domain. This is what you got to call the shots on. It was enough that women were largely disenfranchised from other decision making. Um, but at least in her own home, a woman was in charge of, of the way it got run. Um, that's been taken away from her. Why? Because the so-called rest cure is what was prescribed for her. Now, in her section on why I wrote the yellow wallpaper, she vilifies Dr. Silas Weir Mitchell. There's he, there he is over on the right-hand side there, who, when she was dis, uh, suffering her own postpartum depression, told her to do absolutely nothing. Don't go anywhere. Don't see anything. Oh, well, I love to write. Don't do that. Don't read anything. Just absolute isolation and rest. And she says, I nearly lost my mind. You know, Gilman, like the narrator, is a highly creative person um, and writes. And we now know that writing is a terribly therapeutic thing. In fact, it's something that really helps you get better. Um, and so it was only when she got to a point, a breaking point, where she said, Gilman, that is, I'm going to defy this doctor because I think he's a quack and doesn't know what he's talking about. Because when I write, I actually feel better. Duh. She pretty much comes up with her own cure to her own postpartum depression insofar as she can and absolutely rejects what this moron doctor doesn't doesn't seem to have any awareness of. She vilifies him pretty well. By the way, um, there's a there's an actor today who was in a series called Grimm. Um, that's that's his ancestor. He's named Silas Weir Mitchell after, I believe that's his great uncle or great great uncle. I can't recall exactly, but he was named after him. So you can Google him if you want to. Looks considerably more handsome than that fellow. In any, in any event, what you see in the short story is this slow descent into madness, this stripping away of her autonomy, of her decision-making power. Everything's being done for her. She's being totally isolated. But here's the question I have for you. Did you ever consider that one of the things that John tells her not to do, which is to write, well, but she must have done it because the short story is like a diary, isn't it? So, ah, yes, I know. Uh, so you say, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, he told her not to write. Wait a minute. How do we have this then? Right? She defied him. She says that as a small child, she frequently was very imaginative and creative and, and all these things. And John's saying, no, 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 that's really bad for you. It's bad for you. No, no, no. You need absolute boredom. You need to be completely cut off. You know, this is what we do to prisoners who are really bad in prison. We put them in solitary confinement. And yet that's, you know... That's what this Weir Mitchell told Charlotte Perkins Gilman to do, and she said it nearly drove me absolutely insane. She becomes completely unaware of what's going on. She begins to see things in the paper, right? She sees another woman in the paper. She doesn't say who this woman is, but she sees her coming out of the paper every now and then, and she sees her 
crawling around the room on all fours, rubbing against the wall. And then she says, I wonder what's causing that smooch or that smudge, right? A rub spot against the wall. Then she also says, I can't seem to get that smell of the wallpaper out of my, out of my mind or out of my nose. It's like everywhere I go, I smell this wallpaper. Duh. What she's not aware of, the narrator, but you, I hope, are beginning to become aware of is this anonymous woman in the wallpaper who sometimes gets out and creeps around, she says, she's losing the ability to differentiate herself from the woman in the wallpaper. She's become that woman by the end of the short story. And in fact, she's the one who's creeping around and creating the smudge on the wallpaper. She's the one that's doing that, the smooch or whatever she wants to call it. And the reason that you can smell the wallpaper everywhere you go, because it's probably in your hair and on your clothes everywhere, right? Because you've been doing that. She doesn't even know that she's doing that. She thinks the woman is doing that. So you almost got this multiple personality thing going on. Um, and it's quite a remarkable story. It's quite a remarkably accurate depiction of mental instability because Gilman lived through it. I mean, she actually lived through this. Of course, at the end, it wraps up um, with um, her husband basically trying to break down the door because she's locked herself in. She says, why, there's John at the door. It's no use, young man. You can't open it. Notice she wouldn't say young man to her husband. She's become the woman in the wallpaper who's now escaped. How does he call, how he does call and pound. Now he's crying for an axe. It would be a shame to break down that beautiful door. John, dear, said I in the gentlest voice, the key is down by the front steps under a plantain leaf. Um, then he said, but very quietly indeed, open the door, my darling. I can't, said I, the key is down on the front under a plantain leaf. And then I said it again several times, very gently and slowly, and said it so often that he had to go and see, and he got it, of course, and came in. He stopped short by the door. What's the matter, he cried. For God's sakes, what are you doing? I kept on creeping just the same. But I looked at him over my shoulder. She's down on all fours, creeping around, rubbing against the wall, basically looking over her shoulder at him. Um, I've got out at last, said I, in spite of you and Jane. Right. So the narrator's name is Jane. She's become the woman in the wallpaper, and she's saying, I've got out of the wallpaper at last. And I've pulled off most of the paper so you can't put me back. Now, why should that man have fainted? But he did, and right across my path by the wall so that I had to creep over him every time. So she, she keeps going all the way around the room again and again, and she just creeps right over him when she gets to him each time she goes around, right? And that's the end. So a little melodramatic on the end, I'll, I'll have to say. But take a look at this. So, so it raises several questions that I think are really interesting. Number one, the, the seeming sense of powerlessness women may have had at that time, many of them did, with regard to medicine and health in the 19th century. Almost all physicians were, were male. And I'm sorry, but postpartum depression and other aspects of women's reproductive health and, and, and well-being were things that a lot of these men just didn't study much. They just thought, well, women are just, that's just how they are. Um, and they didn't really make it a priority to look into these kinds of things. Very ironic that Charlotte Perkins Gilman uh, was diagnosed with terminal breast cancer, another illness that the male-dominated medical institution didn't really do much with, didn't really study very much. Now we do more, which is good, but a lot of these illnesses, because medicine was dominated by men, and it's no coincidence that everybody in the story who's male is a physician just about, um, just didn't seem to get it when it came to women's illnesses and women's difficulties in, in terms of health and, and these sorts of things. Um, but also the male dominance in the institution of marriage and its destructive nature. This, this narrator has been raised not to question her husband and not to question doctors. And when your husband is a doctor, then you've got this sort of double down on never question some an authority figure like that. And it ends up being self-destructive because had she questioned her husband's diagnosis, had she questioned her husband's authority in making decisions about her own health, she wouldn't have experienced this descent into madness, right? So Gilman didn't have a great marriage either, as I said. Um, what is her view of marriage and how it is and how it ought to be? Well, clearly she thinks that there are some things that are wrong with the modern world and 
however you want to attribute it and however you want to characterize it, certainly the marriage institution isn't what it should be. It becomes clear in this short story, and clearly the state of health, and particularly health for women and medical attention for women isn't what it should be, very misunderstood uh, by, by the dominant establishment. So you can read this story as a personal experience, and I think that that's the first thing we should do. You can read the story as something that has something to do with the way marriage, marriages are constructed and how powerless it, it left some women feeling, and about the medical establishment and how it, too, left women feeling sometimes powerless and misunderstood. It's very unfortunate that, that that's the case, but certainly um, uh, it's a powerful presentation of it. Uh, remember that I've already given you information about the quiz, so if all you did was skip to this last video to find the quiz, surprise, surprise, it's somewhere else. You'll need to go back. Um, make sure that you uh, have our quiz uh, sent to me by email by uh, Tuesday at noon, if you would, to my Yahoo account.